Hello, my name is Aaron, and this is the second part to our Cloud on for Colocation discussion, Cluster Fundamentals and Configuration. So let's recap briefly. In part one, we learned that Cloud on for Colocation has four components. At a minimum, two CSPs and two Catalyst 9500 48-port switches. Assuming you've selected the colocation or data center you wish to deploy your cluster in, the next step is to determine how your pod will arrive, pre-wired or a la carte. With turnkey in mind, Cisco offers this solution pre-wired and racked from the factory so that all you need to do is provide power and an active internet connection. But for those of you that are interested in how the cluster is wired, let's explore. It should be noted that with version 20.3 of Cisco SD-WAN, Cloud on for Colocation now supports flexible topologies, meaning you can cable the cluster however you want and use vManage to identify which cables went to which ports. That said, a prescriptive cabling guide is available for anyone running version 20.1 or lower or for those of you who wish to stick with Cisco's best practice. Notice on your screen the presence of a fifth device, a top-of-rack switch. Cisco's turnkey pod will include this switch for you, but if you purchase this solution a la carte, you'll need to provide this switch. The top-of-rack switch should have sufficient bandwidth to support connectivity into the colocation cluster, as well as be able to support LACP port channeling. The top-of-rack switch facilitates all of the management interface connections for cluster components, as well as terminates any physical WAN connectivity before handing it off to the Catalyst 9500s. Each device in the cluster has a management cable to this switch, denoted in red on the diagram. This connection allows out-of-band management to Cisco Integrated Management Controller, or SIMC, NFVIS, the Catalyst 9500s, and any virtual machine equipped with a management interface. Of particular note are the NFVIS and cluster uplink and downlink ports. These ports are pre-configured from the factory as LACP port channels, and as such, the top-of-rack switch should also be configured for LACP port channeling to accommodate. Moving down on the drawing, notice how each CSP is cabled into the Catalyst 9500s. A total of eight connections from each CSP are required. Since the Catalyst 9500s operate in stack-wise virtual mode, they will appear as one logical switch to the CSPs. Four of these connections per CSP represent the SRIOV, data path for VNFs, slots 1 and 4, which are two port Intel NEAN tech cards. The remaining four connections represent the OVS data and HA port channels housed in slot 2, which is an Intel Fortville card. This connection arrangement allows for up to 40 gigabits of bandwidth per chassis per NIC virtualization option. Depending on how VNFs are deployed within the chassis, up to 80 gigabits of bandwidth can be realized per chassis. More on that in subsequent videos. Cisco Stackwise Virtual is facilitated by three connections, denoted in a light blue and green on your screen. These connections provide an inner chassis link for port channeling, as well as dual activity detection. Lastly are the uplink and downlink ports. These four connections, two per switch, are in an LACP port channel and will typically land within the top of rack switch. In this way, the top of rack switch can terminate WAN connectivity and hand off individual VLANs into the colocation cluster via the uplink or downlink ports. This is not a hard requirement, however. Some customers may opt to run the WAN and connectivity directly into the Catalyst 9500s. Bear in mind, however, that these are LACP port channels, so the opposite end of this link should be configured to match. Before powering the cluster on, there are a few things that you should be aware of. First, the cluster requires DHCP so that both CSPs and Catalyst 9Ks can obtain an IP address for onboarding purposes. This can be hosted via the top of rack switch, or by any other device outside of the cluster connected to the top of rack switch. Second, the CSPs will require internet access. Ensure that the IP addresses assigned to these devices can reach out to the Cisco PNP portal, devicehelper.cisco.com, for provisioning. And likewise, ensure that these CSPs have control plane access to the organization's vManage and vBond controllers. Third, and finally, allocate one of your management IPs to be statically assigned to the Colo Configuration Manager container. Colo Configuration Manager will be discussed in more detail in the troubleshooting video, but in a nutshell, CCM is a container hosted within the CSP that provides proxy access to your vManage for the Catalyst 9500s. You must configure DHCP option 43 to point to your CCM so that the Catalyst 9500s can onboard themselves appropriately. Once cabling and DHCP prerequisites are satisfied, it's time to hop into vManage and begin the process of configuring the cluster. Navigate to Configuration, Cloud OnRamp for Colocation. Click on the Configure and Provision Cluster button. Begin by clicking on each of the switch and CSP icons. 
Here, we will select the appropriate switch and CSP serial number that has been allocated to the cluster you wish to configure. This list is generated based on the user's smart account. As part of the ordering process, CSP and switch licensing should have been deposited into the smart account or virtual account associated with this vManage. Next, click on the Credentials button. Here you can define the credentials that will be assigned to the devices in this cluster once they are fully provisioned. Under normal circumstances, the customer should not need to log into these devices. Setting credentials in this screen will ensure that resources such as TAC have access to the CSPs and switches should the need arise to troubleshoot. Next, click on the resource pool. The resource pool is one of the key elements to cluster provisioning as it defines how VNFs hosted within this cluster will communicate. Since IP addressing structure, VLANs, and management information changes between co-locations, it's important to define this information in this screen. DTLS Tunnel IP, also known as System IP in Viptela nomenclature, is a pool of IP addresses that gets assigned to any device that joins the SD-WAN fabric through this cluster, such as the CSPs and any SD-WAN VNF. The Service Chain VLAN pool defines which VLANs the system is allowed to assign to VNFs to establish the Layer 2 stitching necessary for service chaining. These VLANs are typically not exposed outside of the cluster. As VNFs boot up and require connectivity to one another, VLANs from this pool will be provisioned to stitch segments together. Likewise, the VNF data plane IP pool serves a similar purpose, only from a Layer 3 perspective. This pool of IP addresses will be assigned to VNFs automatically as they boot up to provide IP connectivity to other VNFs within the cluster. The VNF Management IP pool, Management Gateway, and Mask will define the existing management IP subnet in place within your configured DHCP server. Lastly, Switch PNP Server IP refers to the IP address that you want assigned to Colo Configuration Manager, which should be referenced in your DHCP Option 43 configuration as well. Click on the Port Connectivity button next. As mentioned previously, version 20.3 of Cisco SD-WAN vManage allows the user to customize how the CSPs and Catalyst 9500s are connected together. If you choose the turnkey model, in which the rack is cabled for you, or you chose to cable the cluster as specified in the solution guide, you can leave everything on this screen at default. If you chose to modify any of the connections, simply click on the port you wish to remap and remap as appropriate. Next, click on the NTP button. Although optional, NTP is highly recommended for accurate timekeeping. Click on the syslog button. As with NTP, this parameter is optional, though highly recommended. When finished, provide a name, description, site ID, and location, and click the Save button. Click the ellipsis to the right of your new cluster and choose Activate. The vManage template provisioning workflow should appear. Click the Configure Devices button and confirm the configuration. The cluster can now be powered on, if it hasn't been already. One final step is necessary to begin the onboarding process. From the vManage Configuration Devices screen, locate your CSPs and note the chassis ID and token values. These values will need to be pasted into NFEIS. To do this, SSH into the IP address assigned to NFEIS via DHCP. Alternatively, you can access the NFEIS console through the Cisco Integrated Management Controller of the CSP. If using that option, browse to the web interface of the IP address assigned to SIMC or SSH to the SIMC IP address. Once logged in, issue the command connect host. This will connect you directly to the console of NFEIS. The default username is admin and the default password is capital A DMIN123 hash, but you'll likely be asked to change this once connected. Once connected to NFEIS, onboard each of the CSPs with the request activate command, followed by the chassis and token values you noted down earlier. The CSPs, after checking in with devicehelper.cisco.com, will be redirected to the organization's vBond, then ultimately to vManage. The CSP with the lowest serial number will then spawn Colo Configuration Manager with the IP address specified in the cluster configuration workflow, which is also referenced in your DHCP option 43. After CCM successfully boots, the Catalyst 9500s will begin onboarding themselves into the CCM. You may notice the switch is rebooting during this time to form a virtual switch. The entire activation process can take upwards of 35 to 40 minutes.
When finished, your cluster should transition to an active state as verified in the Configuration Cloud OnRamp for Colocation menu. Should you have any trouble, please reference the troubleshooting video.